Greetings, everybody, and welcome back. Anthony Russell here from Banners on the Wall. And, well, what better way to kind of finish off the 23-24 season for this little series that I've been doing alongside the Solon Devils with the man who joins me now. He doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. So we'll do it as we have been doing the others. Your name, please, sir. Uh, my name is Alex Murray. Jersey number? 73. And you probably don't want to answer this question, but you have to anyway. Number of years with the Solent Devils? It's a good question. Um, I want to say near 13 to 14 now, albeit in two stages, but maybe even close to nah, 13, 14. This current spell has got to be 10 plus. Yeah. It's been been so long, you just don't know, do you now? That it just all merged into one. Yeah, it does at this stage. But the um, either way, folks, what we're doing today is Alex has kind of graciously given up some of his time. Where in the past we've we done some interviews with some other folk and we've kind of gone through their hockey careers, putting putting the detail in the devils, as it were. Well, Alex and I are going to sit down and put the detail in the devils in the context of 2023, 2024. Because, of course, the season is now done. We don't need to bash through Alex's career because so much of it has been in Gosport. It's almost pointless to kind of, kind of uh, rake over the coals in that sort of sense. However... What we are going to do is we're going to look back at the season that we've just had because, of course, whilst the ending was not the perfect fairy tale, there was certainly some excitement. 23 24 has been a fascinating year, not just for the Solent Devils, but also for South One as a division. It's been a pretty intense, pretty, pretty massive year, I think, for the division that's seen the quality in a number of places go up. Uh, obviously, a little bit of a similar result at the end, some would say, but there's been some bumps and some things along the way that we probably should talk about. Alex, we probably do need to go back to the end of last season because obviously the playoff final didn't end the way you wanted to and you were greeted knowing that you had a raft of guys that weren't coming back. Originally, Mark Pitts had said he wasn't going to be returning. Chico Cole, who I still maintain is probably one of the best netminders at this, uh, at this level to ever play, uh, retiring. A bunch of guys stepping away. I don't know whether you've got like a whiteboard in your house or however you did it, but when you were looking to put together the roster for this season, what was the plan? Because there were some very, very big holes you had to fill. Um, no whiteboard. I actually use my notes on my uh, iPhone. And, uh, <laughs> it's really strange. What I do is I, I'm, I'm not really a, I'm not really a big person or a fan of teams or coaches or clubs that go out and actively just kind of. I don't know, like a like a fire, you know, like a rapid fire everywhere, and just approach absolutely every member of every team and just go with the same message, you know, it's with a spray gun, if you know what I mean, and just kind of hope you hit one. I think to play for Solent, given who we are, our budget, and what what we can offer, which is a great time, um, and that's about it. You, you kind of have to find the right people and, and to find the right people, you've got to have find people that want to actually be a part of your organization, want to be a part of the story and, and want to make an impact. And I think, yeah, notes is perfectly fine for that. Um, mm -hmm. And what I do is I basically just write down on one side, the players that I assume slash hope return from the current mm -hmm. squad. Obviously, you have retirements. You, you you do have players leave, and unlike most clubs, we don't have the the merry-go-round of players leaving. You know, it's normally down to retirement, and there will be others, of course. And then I just have a handful of players that I think suit our DNA, and I think that's so important because our culture is a, a major part of the reason we are successful. It's not a I'm going to build a championship winning team. What does that look like and how much does it cost me um, to assemble it? It's I want like-minded individuals with the same culture, mentality, the same philosophies. And that builds a team as opposed to an individuals. And then with that, you get the success or relative success given who we are in the last half many years. So to answer your specific question, yeah, it was tough to lose those players, Chico in particular. I know it's been spoken about a lot. We, you know, he's he is one of the, if not the biggest club legend that this club will ever see or have. And to have those shoes filled was a big task. But I basically had two people in my mind, and one of them came off. So, yeah, I don't know what I don't know if others didn't. I guess it's it, you'll never know. 
Well, that's just knowing the amount of jobs you've done for the organisation, you've probably had a go at yourself at some stage where it had all gone wrong. But it does it does lead on to the fact that, of course, you didn't run with two. You ran with three this year for the most part. And it certainly raised a few eyebrows when it was announced that you'd have Aaron Taylor, you'd have Mark Duffy, and you'd have Rory Martin Edwards kind of as your, your triumvirate of netminders this year. Certainly, I think that the people were potentially wondering where the bulk of that, even that where the bulk of that workload was going to fall. But Aaron has, uh, particularly as well, if we think back to playoff weekend, aside from the fact in the semi-final, he probably pulled off the game of his life. People, I think, have potentially been a bit surprised, especially because Aaron had been at, been off the ice for such a long period of time. Yeah, not a surprise to me. Um, and again, there's talented players all around. It's just opportunity, and I think that's what we offer. I think that is my that is my gambit to any player that I speak to or approach. Is I'm not here to sell you a dream. You know, I'm not. I know some clubs love to ring you up and tell you that they're going to do certain things. I think the way that Solent do it is we're here to provide you an opportunity, a platform for you to showcase your skills, and I will try and support you, and give you the the assisting tools to achieve that. And ultimately. There's then down to you as an individual and how much you invest. Your commitment is is up to you. You know what I mean by that is is your commitment to training in a game is one thing, but your commitment to your diet, your health, your off ice, how you how you conduct yourself, social media, um, is is encompassing in your role as as a hockey player and a member of our club. So you, you mentioned three. We've always had three. I always try and make the third one or two way so they get chance to play. Um, you're you're not only too well of goalies coming up through the Basingstoke um, system that don't get that opportunity and then ultimately end up never having to play. And whilst being a part of a team is a really positive thing, I also think having having game time as a goaltender is vital because I don't think you peak as a goaltender until late twenties, early thirties anyway. And it's a it's a short window of peaking, I think, for a goaltender, but it's definitely not at twenty one. And so to be chucked in at the deep end at 21 and sink or swim is is not fair. So I've always tried to have three and the, the third being the one that always plays with the second team. Hmm. And at the start of the year, it really was an open, it was an open opportunity for both Mark and Aaron to stamp their authority and take claim for that spot that's been held down for so long by one individual. And through no fault of his own, as you spoke with Mark uh, recently, with injury and work, he was unable to to take that opportunity. Whereas Aaron grabbed it with two hands and never let it go. Yeah. We do have to mention Rory Martin Edwards into this as well, because he obviously he's got a, a very active life outside of hockey and the services and stuff like that. But for for him to have eleven, uh, he made um, I believe it was at, he he dressed for eleven games. Just looking at the numbers, actually, now as they finally come up in front of me, five games actually played, and a uh, what effectively works out as a two and one record, which, given as well the amount of ice time he saw, the junior doubles getting into the playoffs as well, as a what is that you know the the de facto kind of third option in this? That's that's net minding depth that a lot of clubs at Southland don't have the option of. Yeah, look, Rory's a, a a wonderful prospect. He has been for years, and ultimately he could have come into the seen a lot earlier but that would have not been successful in my opinion with Chico in goal he would have had limited game time whereas at the moment he has seen um, a lot of shots um, a lot of game time at division two and played a role that's you won't learn at our level being a backup at 20 21 years old so that's just how I work I've worked it through the likes of some name dropping if you go back as far as Elliot Lewis for example you know, Elliot's time when I brought him in as a 16, 17 year old, he wasn't ready for Division One. Did he have a skill set for Division One, 100 percent? But had he been someone that had been relied on to score goals, had he played on a power play, had he done special teams, has he been on the last minute of the game? Well, no, was the answer at 16s, at 18s at Guildford. It wasn't like that. And it it's you don't get that exposure. You know, what's the pressure of playing an under 18s game at Guildford compared to what's 1,200, 1,300 people watching you at Bristol back then when Elliot was making his name with us. You had 1,300 people watching you at Bristol and that's a completely different um, side of the game that you're not prepared for. So what does the Division 2 team allow? It allows the likes of Rory to make, um, you know, learn their trade, develop confidence, skills, environments that they're not used to, situations they're not used to, so that they're better equipped when it happens in an environment where there's more pressure they mentally just think, well, I've been here before. 
and it and the process is much easier to happen you know rory is on a trajectory to be pushing down that and you know, knock on that door and he has done this year and he's rightly so earned himself some ice time alongside aaron and mark and and um yeah the depth in, in goaltending is strong in, in our club and i think that's shown throughout the year with the limited goals that we've conceded and how we even though we play on such a small rink we still keep the the scores down relatively most of the time you mentioned elliot lewis and i think he I, I do have to mention as well um probably one of the signings certainly the signing i think that raised the majority of eyebrows for people outside of division one uh last summer was the return back to, was the return back of kane russell which having played having played for bristol having played for for basingstoke having had time in america kane's uh, kane signing in division one south felt like quite a big coup for the devils especially as well where they've seen obviously that young group at slough was getting better you had the new era at chelmsford and the bunch of guys that dropped down from the national to that getting a young player like kane on board was something that kind of made people a lot of people outside of the division feel like that so we're going to be sticking around and and still were able to kind of compete at the top end of the pack how did how did you manage to convince kane to come to the club i think there's two things first of all a lot of credit has to go to his brother-in-law which is callum Perella fox um so callum is married to kane's sister um, cheating cheating is the best way to get yeah so you know kane obviously is a junior and you know his family uh, um you know grew up at gospel and that's where he learned his trade and yes whilst he's gone away and had a great success he's also been away from home a long time you know he was away in in the states and, and what have you and with you know playing away comes a time where you probably just want a bit of time back with family I think that was a little bit in in his decision making. I think the scheduling. Um, I think some personal personal stuff going on in his life in terms of work and job meant that you could probably get a sim. You know, the, the, the gap is closing between national and South One, and I think for now, lots of players are making active choices for the reduced schedule, the reduced travelling over the heavy heavy schedule at national where your scheduling is worse than premiership footballers if that makes sense in terms of commitment yet you don't get a luxury five bedroom house or a lamborghini to go with it you probably just get a bit of grief from your partner or wife and then none, none better for it so i think to answer your question specifically there was a lot of moving pieces that allowed kane to return i'm delighted that he did um he had a he had a season played with with some injuries but his character and resolve came through and none other more deserving than his performance in the semi-final which we know that he's capable of doing and taking games away from other teams his skill set is exceptional um and above all he's just a great guy you know he's someone that you want in your room he's really funny he's a great lad and he's really you know sort of chilled out but then when it's game time he's very dialed in so yeah but uh, you, you could call it a coup yeah i mean i think don't get me wrong when me and callum first were discussing it it was a bit like really and then you know when you scratch underneath the surface there's always there's always factors that that you know make any club appealing at any level and we're delighted that he chose us do you think given the amount of guys that have dropped out of national as you say the national division has obviously expanded you know expanded last year solway coming in as an organization May, May was arguably very good for the league, very good for hockey in, in the southwest of Scotland. But it did leave a lot of guys, particularly those guys down in the south, with an option as to whether they wanted to have that extra bit of travel. As a club, you didn't pick up tons of guys to drop out of the national. And I and you know, you've you've mentioned already kind of about budgets and bits and pieces like that. And I'm I'm assuming that played a bit of a factor, but getting getting those guys that kind of as you said fit fitted the vision and fitted the culture potentially kind of played into a bit of this as well did you go for guys that just it, and it just didn't come off no, or was it always so, the plan to just go with what you went with yeah as i said to you at the start it's really difficult it, you know solent will always be gospel in terms of where we play and the location and we are the southernest team in the league in the country and there's not much appeal to want to go there in terms of i i love playing at that rink I love the warmth and I love the facility. That's one thing. You're not, you haven't got that. So there's no pool there. We don't have clubs left and right of us within a 20 mile radius where players who don't quite fit in one part. If you look at the M4 corridor, for example, you could travel 20 minutes up the road and find yourself at two new clubs. 
And so if you're not quite getting the exposure or the team doesn't quite suit you in one of the M14s, in your car, you pop and off you go. Money is a, also a major factor for the players that are dropping out because they associate hockey with those expenses. And that's no discredit to any of them. You know, I, I understand entirely if you're asking someone to drive an hour, two hours per training session per game and there's no minibus or coach, there's, there is not much of an appeal at Solent. I think our appeal has always been the same. We are a team that provides opportunity, a stepping stone for players that want to progress. We are a competitive club. I think our fan base are exceptional. And we always have this joke that we are the most professional non, you know, we are the most professional amateur club in in the country. And by that, I mean, our volunteers are, are exceptional. They make you feel like you're playing in the national or above, you know, whether it be equipment managers, whether it be, you know, Joe in, in the past doing his interviews and his social media, whether it be our fan base or our supporters club, you, you, you felt a part of it and players played for that reason. And that, ultimately was i feel one of the biggest cogs in our you know in our system that allowed us to be successful the scattergun approach where you just ask players to come and it will be this much per week or whatever it is doesn't it it doesn't we can't do that and it doesn't fit us because we all play at solent because we want to play and so when our backs are against the wall our team bonding in unison and how we all approach it is that we're, we're all here for a reason. You know, we're all here because we enjoy being here. And I personally find that that brings an extra level of resilience. And that's why you see results like you do at the semi final. Don't get me wrong, that's, there is some skill involved and there is some coaching too. I'm not going to discredit that. But there is not many bonds like ours, I don't feel, in terms of the reasons why they're there, the commitment that the players have to give to play for our club. You know, we have players this year that are travelling over two hours per trip for for a thank you, if you know what I mean, for a for an appreciation as opposed to, well, at least we can put the money away and we'll go on a holiday at the end of the year sort of thing. Does that make sense? So hmm. that in itself takes commitment and you have to be a certain type of player. So to spin back to your original question, I... I think I reached out to maybe a couple that I've reached out to many years. You know, you're just basically sending the same messages. Is it time yet? If you look at Dan Lackey as a perfect example, not local, but a Basingstoke guy. And I, you know, I think for three, four years in a row, you should just say, is it time yet that you came and played a lead role in a, mm. in a team as opposed to the, the supporting role? And I think for four years, he said no chance until he you know, got to meet us, understand us, and then never looked back sort of thing. Well, we move into the season because, of course, the first competitive game, which feels like a lifetime ago now, the 16th of September last year, which was uh, which was the one of the which was the first competitive game I made it to this season, which was you guys against Invicta. You guys don't play a preseason. You um you haven't done for many a year. What is the feeling like going into that thing? You've obviously built this roster. You've trained. You've got a rough. You've got an idea. As to where you're gonna, as to where things are potentially gonna land, but you don't really know. The proof is in the pudding when they step foot on the ice. What was the feeling midway through that game against Invicta? Did you feel like you'd got it close to where you needed it? We were excited. I think we were. I remember that game like it was yesterday. Five. I'll say that, and now I'm gonna guess the score at five two or five three. Um, it was five three, so close. Yeah. But they're on the second attempt. Um, we were uh, the, the home games at Sone are really special. The crowd are on you; they're they're really close. It's um, it's a it's an exciting place to play, and I, I just remember the guys being really excited. There's 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 no pressure at Sone in that extent because there's no, you know, everyone had kind of written us off for this year, and just have a team of guys that want to prove everyone wrong, sort of thing, and. We were really excited. I think we we were excited to have the likes of Kane in the lineup. We were apprehensive. You know, Aaron was given the start in that game. He trained well, and we had asked Dan Lackey to f to fill Pitsy's role at first line centre, and he'd already told me a thousand times he's not a centre. I said, "Get the puck to Liam and Kane. The we'll figure the rest out." And um, yeah, I was. 
we got out the blocks. We played a hell of a game, and you know, we you just kind of felt good. I think Aaron settled in. You know, Aaron's a confident goalie, but even he would admit that he was a bit apprehensive and nervous. And it was a hell of a performance. I remember saying to Callum, who's probably one of my, you know, points of reference when we when I need to reflect on coaching and stuff. I said Kane looks good with Liam. It was it was just a game where we thought, Do you know what, we got this right. Um, but of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that you get it right every game of the year. It, it was for that game alone. We just felt good. And yeah, well, I think we played a really good game. I think we, for, I know they came out strong to start, but I think once we'd settled and got rid of the little anxious nerves, we'd settled into the game and kind of controlled that game. And it, yeah, you're right. It does seem a long time ago, but one that's fond in the memory. One thing that always strikes me, and I think this was a criticism I made at the time, and I, I had this conversation with Carl Lennon, so I don't feel that bad about kind of saying it out loud. Does it surprise you, given the fact that Gosport is the smallest rink in the division, when teams come and try to play really, really expansive hockey, at what stage are these teams going to learn that they can't do that in this building? This, uh, so, without giving it too much... It benefits you that they don't. It really benefits <laughs> you that they don't. Yeah, well, t to be honest, there are... There are a couple. There are a couple of things that we struggle with, which I'm not going to tell you on here, of course. But <laughs> if teams play a certain way, we we're not built for that, and so adapting in game is is a challenge because I'm playing as coaching, and mm -hmm. that message you we we kind of prepare for teams in a certain way, and if they come with a different plan, they often are more successful that way as opposed to just sticking to the same thing i don't want to give too much away i don't want to you know, i'm not saying they're all listening by the way i doubt they are but <laughs> hi um, lucas hi ben hi everybody <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to it's hard to explain but ultimately we we have an, a home game setup that's completely different to an away game setup hmm. and i've always said this to whoever i speak to we're very systematic in terms of they do this we do that and if all five players do that there won't be a breakage in the system. The problem comes is when four do this and one goes, what was that that Muzz said on training first? Act? I can't quite remember. And then that's when the breakdown happens. And at this level, you know, consistency is one of the biggest factors in different levels in players. You know, you'll see a skill set from a certain player and wonder why they don't play another, another level up. And that will be linked to consistency and how they apply themselves and in different scenarios. So... Yeah, look, many teams have come in the last couple of years and done well. So I won't say that it's the fortress that it used to be in my early time of playing at the club. Teams are working out. And so it's my challenge now to have plan B ready to go for when they do counteract how we play. And I'm just grateful at the moment, obviously, given our playoff run that Invicta, obviously this year, weren't as successful as some others. But don't doubt that they'll be working hard at trying to overcome that. Mm. I suppose then that question, because of course half a season is played, not at home. Yeah. One of the things, what well, certainly one of your one of your more routine game plans, shall we kind of say, and you've mentioned this in a bunch of a bunch of places on zero pucks given in other places as well. You've always had great success as a team where you set yourself up as come and break us down. You don't you don't go you don't send the boys charging off into the into the distance. It's not the chance of the light brigade. You set you tell the other team come and come and break us down you come find the holes and they have to they have to do that bit of math as to figure out where the get where the gaps are going to be that obviously doesn't work as you said that doesn't work all the time but are are you finding now that teams are re, uh, teams are starting to do a bit more uh, do a bit more of that and therefore that's giving you a chance as a coach to do some different things particularly away from home where it's you know you're going to a bunch of different ice pads different sizes because oxford is different to milton Keynes, which is different to streatham i mean from a coaching perspective there's you, you've got some real opportunity to do some very very expert kind of tinkering around with while still kind of playing devil's hockey for want of a better phrase yeah no i think i think having those options now given how many teams are moving to bench staff for example they're able to make those in-game changes. I think we've got to di diversify in terms of how we approach games. I think the the core of this team has 
got the devil's philosophy down to a T and can sing it off a hymn sheet. But it allow that allows the newer guys who are not as many at our club that come in. It allows them to make rapid progression in those because there's so many that do know it. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. on your line, there's only one guy that's trying to learn it as opposed to three. So mm -hmm. you've got four other guys pulling you through it. As you mentioned, though, you know, with with how the league's become, with the 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 you know the emergence of some wonderful talent at this level, it's becoming much harder. And so we are looking at different ways, and we play a different game away from home anyway. You look at someone like Kane, who we've mentioned before. Kane is licking his lips at an away game when he sees the Milton Keynes or the, the Streatham size ice pads, as opposed to, hang on a minute, you're asking me to go in that corner over there and work the corner and battle for a puck. You know, that's the likes of Dan Lack and Mark Pitts who are going, yes, please, give me some of that. And so different players have, you know, different responsibilities and and perform differently given given the circumstance. So, yeah, it's it's an ever ever evolving system. I feel. So obviously, opening night went well. The beginning of the season was a little bit patchy. Two games against Chelmsford into that didn't help, and you were you were you uh, you lost three of your first five. But you then went on a five-game winning streak off the back of that to take you through towards the uh, towards the mid towards the middle of November. At what point into the season as a coach are you sitting back and actually for a moment just kind of taking stock of where we are? Because obviously post-game, every game, you're having a bit of a think about, right, we didn't do this right, we've let up too many goals like this, for example. But is there a point in the season in the early part where you just sort of stop and have a proper reflect about everything that's come? Because, you know, sort of, you know, it's about 10 games or so into the season, you're on a five-game winning streak, having had a little bit of a shaky start against some of the top sides. How are you feeling at that point? Because you know, midway through midway through November, not too far into into obviously it's not a very long campaign uh, in South One, even with the additional cup competitions into it. But how are you feeling at that point? Yeah, so it's really strange because obviously the fixtures are basically replicas of the fixtures of the year before. They're very <laughs> rarely just ripped up. It's we always seem to play Shretham near the end of the season. We always play Invicta first, and. It is what it is. So I did actually do a little bit of comparison around that time because last the season before this one, we'd got a, we'd got that run much earlier, mm. um, and we stayed ahead of everyone. A bit like what Slough did this year. Mm. So if we looked at Slough; they got ahead of the game. They played lots of league fixtures yeah, early, yeah. and they got up and above in and around Streatham and, and never moved away and that's what we did the year before this one just gone so we got above everyone we got away from Chelmsford's because we beat them earlier in the year and the year before mm. we got away from Invicta um obviously we got away from Slough but Slough weren't the team they were a year ago as they are today and so then as long as we stayed above 50 percent we were always above them does that make sense they yeah. were then having to go on runs of seven and three or eight and two to try and catch us so this year was one of the first years that we were playing catch up and looking up the lead, you know, looking up the league table as opposed to going, well, the gap between us and Streatham is this. We've got some games coming up because we just we traditionally play Streatham Christmas and beyond. Um and so yeah, it was then looking at well, what are other teams doing? How are we competing? Who have they got to play? Because ultimately our goal was to remain as close to the top as we could and get to February and see see what that means. I, I think you'd be foolish to look at league placings early in the year. It's about getting wins on the board. And you could end up looking too much into it about who you're playing and who they are playing early on. So I think, you know, at that point in the season, I think I was comparing. And mm. I had noticed that for the first time in a long time, we were having to look up as opposed to look down. And that was that was a different feeling. And for the guys, it was a different pressure. It was a different pressure on, right, these these games are now mean more. You know, these yeah. these games are important to keep up. You know, if, if Chams had won on the Saturday and we're only playing on the Sunday, well, it means the gap gets bigger unless we win. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to, well, they're almost catching us up, but we'll be okay. We'll keep away from them. We'll stay at, we'll stay at seven and three over 10 games spans and we'll be okay. Does the scheduling 
would you do would you prefer it to be a bit more even-handed because i i part of me wonders as well not playing over christmas feels like a bit of a kick in the teeth in terms of not being able to put some money back in the coppers because with all you know whether it's chelmsford whether it's Stratton, whether it's any team even even mk of course traditionally don't have the biggest of home attendances that ability to be able to play at home and get that get that christmas money into the pocket might it could be very very useful for clubs across south one and I mean, nobody play between christmas and new year pretty much it depends what your objectives are i mean we're not we're not in the game for that reason at all i play hockey because i love it um and, i went more from an organizational perspective yeah uh, but there's stuff you can do with that money yeah and i mean yes you see for me our family friends time away from the sport is important and i've learned that over my career and how a game seems so important in the moment but actually in the long run is it important and a game over christmas new year's day boxing day i'll I tell you now you, you look back on those and you regret them as a person whether you miss something an event and i am the biggest believer in getting the scheduling reduced and not as a schedule that's this that's the equivalent i mean we play more games than as i mentioned some premier league football teams do and and like i said there's there's no benefit other than the the enjoyment and satisfaction of being able to play the game so for me i'm the opposite to pretty much most that want more gates and more revenue we we're on a, a a small budget and we're fine with our home game allowance and we 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 are the club that we are and i also like to say to the players at christmas go and spend time with your family and friends and your loved ones because ultimately the commitment of those nine months takes a lot out of it and actually more credit should go to those families you know those players with wives girlfriends children that sacrifice time with their husband or boyfriend and to do that at christmas i feel there's no there's no monetary value that would supersede that time if that makes sense there's no and i am luckily for me i am the club so you know barring two other you know two or three others it, it's our it's how we perceive it you know that's why don't we play pre-seasons why don't we join the cup it's because you've got to find the right balance i feel and we have the right balance with the two teams because we have the younger players that that want the games they get the games as long as the scheduling doesn't clash as bad as it did this year it shouldn't <laughs> clash but it seems to always clash um for no reason um and yeah we we are a squad that as you saw early in the year are one of the older teams in the league and so we are a little bit different to say a slough who are full of 20 year olds who don't have potentially as big a commitment with their personal lives i don't know that for fact but if you look at the children alone in our team you know we've got enough to make a junior devils team i think so speaking openly i think finding that balance is key because ultimately we only play the game for the love of it not for anything else would you have just given that answer to me had you been on an 11 game winning streak on the top of the table heading into christmas is my wonder <laughs> yeah yeah because <laughs> yeah because ultimately that downtime is so essential for the players because burnout is real right and and burnout yeah, is true burnout. You, you, you lots of people building up to christmas their work increases demand you know whether it be in any industry the build up to big big um you know seasons or whatever you want to call them you know the, the festive period easters whatever it is they they nine times out of ten mean that most industries your, your work increases or the pressure increases or targets yeah. increase and then you've got the additional pressure of right now i need to find time to go and do shopping do events got to go and see santa got to go and see family and the last thing you want to know, think about is well hang on a minute i've got a, a coach that's leaving at midday we're off to solway or do you know what i mean or we're off to we're off to chelmsford or milton Keynes. there's no there's no need for it i don't think and so i'm all for the breaks i'm all for one game weekends i'm all for a compressed schedule with one game a week one home the next weekend away but unfortunately for me i'm the i'm in the minority when it comes to that sort of thing so 
I'll just sit quietly and then vent on a on a podcast. <laughs> well, I don't sit quietly, actually. That's I never do. You should know me. Actually. No, I was going to say, yes, uh, lying that close to a Sunday will not get you anywhere, Alex. Um, and also, I should say to my friends in Dumfries, I liked that drive. It was fun. Um, either way, last game before Christmas, 16th of December, was a pretty was a pretty hefty loss at home to Streatham. There's obviously then a big gap. And then you came back with that first game, with the first game after Christmas where you win in Slough. And I think there's, a, there's something to be kind of uh, being kind of said that it's not your form at times this year has been very very good and then you've had a little bit of a dip and then you come back up and unfortunately due to the very very short nate due to the short amount of games that are actually played in the league and where you guys like you say you don't play in the cup and you have your reasons for doing that for that ability to kind of rebound without hurting your league position has kind of kind of sort of put you a little bit on the back foot a, a little bit this year because with only playing league games where you've taken those hits in a really short league schedule your propensity to finish as high as you had done in previous years did suffer as a result yeah i mean we, we it, last year we didn't have additional cup games so like the, not sorry not this year that we're talking about in review the year before that there was no mm. additional cup games all cup games were cup and league games yeah. It was just that in the early days, we got up, like I said to you, we got ahead of ourselves. I think that game against Streatham that you're referring to was, we. thank God we had a break after that. We needed it. Yeah. We had a team ravaged with injury. Um, we had a lot of sickness in the team. And so did Streatham, to be honest. I think, I don't know if it was that game or the one just after Christmas that they came with about 11, 12 guys. And we should have really taken opportunity there. They were the same, injury, sickness. So... That that time during Christmas, that downtime that not many wanted, was probably the catalyst to that three-game, six-point week, slough on the Wednesday, whoever it was on the Saturday and Sunday. I can't quite remember to be honest, but I just remember the game on in slough. I just think it, it it was so strange. We had guys turning up at any any time. All of uh, we, as anyone that knows me will tell you, I have so many superstitions and OCDs that everyone gets impacted by them on the team bless them they're constantly having to make allowances or accommodating my craziness Eccentric eccentricities let's call it eccentricities that's and much more polite than crazy so one of the crazy stories in slough is that we a few of us didn't make it out for the national anthem and i had to stand with the crowd because i have to be the last person out of the changing room <laughs> when it's game time but yeah. mark pitts is Mark Pitts had only just arrived after warm-ups, had missed the warm-up and had arrived about five minutes before we were supposed to go out. And I had to just wait for him to get changed. And Mark is, I think, about fourth or fifth last out the room. So all the other guys that go out after him didn't go out either. And then we rush out and uh, we walk out to the, the lights being dit or whatever it was or the music being played. And so, yeah, it... It, it was just one of those. I think the Stratton game was was a, a time for us to have a break. It worked because ultimately the yeah. the first week back we went three for three, and the guys needed that break. And yeah, we, there's there's no real method in the madness. To be honest, there probably is somewhere, but we're not that in depth to know the reasons why. Really, no. Uh, it was MK followed by Victor was uh, in that week against uh, against Slough. We've got a, we do need to take actually got a step back because you have just mentioned his name. So he did step away and then came back. Tell us about the return of Mark Pitts. What happened? Why? Why after say after after having his grand finale, why why did he come back? I think out of all of them, Mark was probably the one that was unsure. Hmm. And the, the the challenge at Solent, which I know, you know, I've heard, I think you guys speak about it before, whether it be, is that because we are such a small entity and we don't have that history barring the last six to 10 years, we've never really had players, iconic players, mm. players that have been stalwarts of the club, the greatest ever, retired jerseys, all this, here, you know, all this chat that you would have in other clubs with mm. fans that have been there for decades that understand what it means to be those types of players mm. and so to have four players who all in their own right would probably have a case to be a 
devil's legend down in history jersey in the rafter we just we, we i've said it before we've chico obviously decided on the game day Streatham game day that you know he would message me he messaged me about six o'clock then put a message in, in the team chat saying i think this is it boys this is going to be my last game and i just think it was a catalyst for a couple of other boys to go yeah do you know what it's my last game too sort of thing and so i actually spent that morning with joe <laughs> rather than thinking about the game going we should do something for the boys they are we owe them so much and i look back on that day a lot about how we did it and mark was the only one that was a little bit like oh i don't really know I, I, probably probably so i always thought that he would be the one that would get the itchy feet and i do you know shall i tell you when i knew that he would come back because oh, he man. didn't miss he didn't miss one summer skate for about two and a half months so we go back for like an optional yeah. you can skate if you want during yeah. the months of june july august and lo and behold there's pitsy back in his stall didn't miss one session so you know whereas someone like Lockie, i think he threw his kit bag at me and said i don't want to ever see this again <laughs> you know what i mean and, and it's still sat at the rink sort of thing so um the kit bag so yeah mark was probably the one that i always wanted not sorry not always i love all, all four of them back was always one that i thought would get the itchy feet and want to come back i think it was just a combination of personal circumstance for him as well as his flyball i don't know if you're not flyball is but he's a relatively success success he has a relatively successful team in flyball which is linked to dogs and tennis balls and relays and yeah. you know that he was growing his his club there so a combination of things but safe to say again i i think we've gone through a stage of losing and i basically phoned him up and said mark we 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 need you back desperately what's it going to take and he just said um give me a, you know let me think about it for a couple of days and he came back and said yeah i was spoken to his, he'd spoken to his partner and off you and the rest you know the rest of the year was and for the guys mark is such a we play so much we're more confident when he's in the team so it really benefited us i think for context listeners now yeah in the period before mark pitts was announced as re-signing the devils had lost a massive uh two games in a row at the point he re-signed um either way we'll, we'll scuttle, we'll hey, scuttle that, past. Those, you you know that you know that um the season's small right yeah, yeah, so yeah we were, exactly, we were exactly. losing games that we don't feel like we should have lost you can't afford if you want to win the league which is our objective you can't lose more than two three games a season so to lose two no. games on the bounce is disaster no that being said because you won those three games at the beginning of january you then immediately lost three on the bounce so i'll ask the question and i'll ask it right on the nose alex why didn't you win the league this year well we weren't good enough thinking i think to compete with the likes of streatham you've got to be consistent and they turn up to every game with an element of consistency and it's hard to explain when i, I remember the year that i won the league on the island when i you, the team is just yeah. the team was you just knew you were going into the game and winning it hard to explain you looked at the guy next to you and the guy to the other and you just thought yeah we've got this and i think streatham have that to an extent where they look up and down their lineup and go do you know what if that guy's on an off night this guy will be all right yeah. and that takes a certain level of mental strength because you have to go into every game knowing that you you know you're expected to win you are due to win and so you need to win there is a different mental capacity and pressure for a team that goes into a game and going well if we win that's great yeah. if we don't no one expected us to win and so that pressure is different so look i think the better questions would have probably have come in the years before that why we didn't win the league i think we were much closer i think this year was always going to be a not a rebuild we've been in a rebuild i think ever since we lost richard facey but we'll always be in a rebuild now because the age of the team but i think what 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 do we want from solon as a as a team we always want to be competitive and come february we want to be somewhere where we're not just going well that was fun because yeah. ultimately there were some teams before christmas going well we're out of everything yeah and then what are you playing for you know ultimately we ended up trying to play for home ice 
we ended up also trying to get into second and third so that we would avoid Streatham in the, in the semi-finals, oddly enough. That was a big conversation of ours as motivation near the end of the year when we knew this that the um that the league was out of our reach. It was okay. Second and third gives us what we had led to have believed a, a slightly easier pathway to the final in our heads. <laughs> and then second is home ice, if that makes sense. And then when it wasn't that and it was between us and Invicta a month to go for the end of the season. Yeah. The motivation then is home ice. Want to finish fourth, home ice, we get to decide when we play. So why didn't we win the league? Well, there's three teams better than us is probably the answer, but uh, <laughs> yeah. the cliche is not a cliche when it's true, is uh, is yeah. something I was always is something I was always told in right. So we get to the end of the season though, you have the the, the regular season ends, you lose uh, you lose that game away on the high road. And all focus and immediately shifts towards uh, towards Invicta. Heading into that weekend, what were, I won't ask what the feeling was because that seems a bit moot heading into playoffs. But what was the plan? What was the plan heading into that Saturday, going down to Gillingham? Because that is a that's a tough place to go. Invicta, like yourselves, had had flash. You know, they're much uh, Invicta with all due respect to them, have been a bit more patchy in their form across the year. They'd had flashes of brilliance and then they'd had, you know, lots of guys out. They travelled short on lots of occasions. How do you prepare for a team like that, even as irrespective of the fact that you've beaten them across the season because, you know, insert hockey cliches about the playoffs here, but how do you prepare for a team where you could get literally any of them? I think... You you could spend too much time worrying about an opposition as opposed to yourself. I think there was mm. some there was there was obviously some confidence there that we had, given our success this year against Invicta. There is the additional kind of 10, 20 percent that every player gets in their energy bar when it's playoff time because everyone knows mm. that it's it's a shootout. You know, you lose it, you're out. The plan was that we we, we felt that we knew Invicta quite well and how they played, their power play, albeit potent. We we knew they favoured last check. We know how in, important he was as well as Thune to, to their offence. And we knew playing at home on the Sunday, going to Invicta was really simple, even or up coming out of that game. And everything is down, is everything is in our hands. And what I mean by that is, is then we've only got ourselves to blame if we lose at home, if yeah. that makes sense. Now, I don't know how much you know about Invicta away on the Saturday, but it was absolutely, the book was thrown out the window in the warm-up. Callum got a puck to the face, shattered his lip, knocked out four teeth, off to A&E, changed the lineup. Next man yeah. up was just everyone moved at the lineup. Harry wasn't due to play the game because he had a sickness bug. Um, before the game, I basically said to him, just get kitted up and do what you can. He ended up taking Callum's role on second line, power play PK, 60-minute yeah. game. Joe and Chris stepped up, played an incredible game as our third unit. Halfway through the game, obviously, most people have seen the video and the stuff about Kane getting knocked unconscious. To see one of your teammates in the in the warm-up with half his face hanging off, being taken to A&E, because of the fault, not of the fault, but our, you know, it, it was linked to two of our own players. They yeah. were mortified. Everyone was physically a bit like, oh, this doesn't look, feel good. You're worried about Callum himself. Then you're worried about Kane getting stretched off, going to A&E. A lot could have gone wrong on that day, no matter how well we planned for it. The next man up mentality of the club, the resolve of the club, the resilience was... was massive that day and i think that led us into the performance the day after mm. i'd say it again that that 7-1 victory was probably the best or at least in line with the semi-finals whole performance was just there was no stopping us there was nothing that was going to stop us on that second leg once we'd gone through the adversity of the saturday and come out victors mm. um I think I said about that second leg as well because I make I do make a distinction about what whether I watch hockey on the television or watch it with my own eyes. And I've obviously I've dipped in and out 
of Solent Devils hockey over the last few years, living as close as I do between sort of Bays and Soak. And I said that, that that second leg on the Sunday was probably the most complete performance I've ever seen yep. from a Devils from a Devils side. And just it was a uh, uh, there was a point I don't remember which goal it was that went in. It was either the third or the fourth. And it's just like they're not losing now. And it's not even the sense of like, oh, you know, hockey's weird and it will get really, really close to the start. I just don't think they. I just don't think they can lose at this point. They just don't want to. I don't think like we I don't, let it happen. I don't feel like we felt we were going to lose either. And that that's not arrogance, by the way, because we're not an arrogant team at all. But you do feel confident, and there's there's a sense of that confidence that crept in. And I know there were, I know I'll be the first to admit that we had the luck of some of the calls, not all of them, because ultimately once you get the luck of a few calls, and I've been on the other end of it, once you lose control of your emotion, you then spiral. And we every mistake that they made we for the you know for the for, for the power plays and stuff, we were relatively success, successful in that court final. We made them we punished them on those special teams, which ultimately back, you know, backed us to our success. And yeah, let, put, took us with so much confidence going into that semi. So come on then, you ruined it for them. <laughs> you haven't beaten them the entire year, and then out of nowhere in the biggest game of the season so far, with absolute, with virtually nobody in the building apart from yourselves. And a few of your own folk that have travelled with you, you took them apart. Right yeah, at the death when you needed to. Do you know what? It was really strange because after the game, I, and don't get me wrong, I, please don't take this the wrong way if anyone's listening. I was met by so many people and humbled in a way, supporters from other clubs, players from other clubs. Um, can't believe he did that. No one expected it. And in my head, I thought, we're not that bad. You know, we're not. I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but our odds, I don't think, would have been a hundred to one going into the fixture, given that we finished second to them on most things in most years. We'd probably been closer to them than most for the last mm. four or five years. Whilst I don't take any away, Stratham on if you played if we played that game another five times, we may not have won the aggregate score if that makes sense. Yeah. But there's just a feeling. And, I, and and it's so strange. Our whole team felt it. We were talking about it Thursday. We were talking about it on the way up Saturday, pre-game. Everything just felt right. Our, our warm-up outside with the boys just felt wholesome and we all felt it clicked. We always do this pre-game ritual stuff outside as a team. We do some announcements. We clap and we cheer and... Some weeks it kind of just feels a bit staged. We have to do it because we're doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the semi-final, we were just we were just on it. We were just there. It just felt right. We we all kind of visualized the same thing. We all had a plan. We all were high on confidence. And yeah, not, I don't think it's every dog has its day because that's doing us a discredit. I think our game plan worked, and we scored early. And when we mm. when we get ahead against teams, we don't often lose games, and the the stats will show you that. Mm. The stats, I'm sure, if, you know, I'm not saying I'm an expert at stats. I had someone for many years do it for me. But when we go ahead in games, we don't often lose them because, as we mentioned at the start of this, our our system is based around break. You've got to break us down, and we trust our goaltenders. If you want to shoot from a an outside or you know, a, low, a, a lower scoring percentage chance, yeah, we'll take you on it. You, you can shoot from there. But if you come into a high danger chance, the chances are you're going to score, so we don't let you in there. And if you do get there, that's because you've done some great play and if you just score, you deserve it. And if yeah. not, I mean, I remember one, I think Ben completely, un Benny Lee Newman completely undressed me, got inside, high danger chance. And Aaron pulled out one of his many great saves. But that's how we plan for that anyway. You know, that's how we we plan. So was it a great feeling? Of course. But we tried to learn from the year before where we over-celebrated the Invicta win. Mm. And I think emotionally drained ourselves. I didn't want to do our winning song. I didn't want to do a picture afterwards. I didn't want to oversell that victory because I think last year we were so emotionally drained for the final yeah. that we did ourselves a disjustice and we didn't 
turn up or perform against Streatham the year before in the final. Yeah. So my thought was, let's all go. Those that are going home, let's get home. Let's get some food. And let's come back ready to go to the next day. Yeah. And unfortunately, we do have to talk about the next day where you fell victims of the Grant Bartlett show. Um, what a weekend he had, of course, at Alexandra Palace. Seven goals in two nights is a, is a performance worthy, worthy of winning any competition. And of course, congrats to Chelmsford on, win, uh, on winning the playoffs. But what... Uh, I mean, it's, it feels it feels horrible to say like what went wrong, but because clearly you didn't win, therefore something did go wrong. But it, with the benefit of hindsight, what's the thing? What's the big thing that would have changed that game in your favour? Do you reckon? Hindsight is a wonderful thing. I'd first yep. I'd start with congratulating <laughs> Cliff and the Chieftains for a, an incredible end to their year. I mean, they blew us apart. They blew Slough apart. And they were deserved winners. There's no way about it. They they played us off the rink, Grant in particular. I think for the Bartlett's, not that you know, I've played against them for more than eight, nine years now. I think my first time against them was maybe for in the island, so probably more than 10 years. They've matured massively this year. And I don't know them well enough to maybe say it, but I'm saying it anyway. They would often get themselves into too emotionally involved in a game. And so they would then let themselves down and that weekend I saw a different I saw a different set of Bartlett's that were focused with one objective and I think maybe Cliff is linked to that um, mm. you know you used to be able to get inside the minds of the Bartlett's yeah. and if they're focused on trying to punch you in the face they're not slap shot and pucks in the back of your goal so no. you kind of go well that will, that will work for me but they were unfazed they were you know Alan Lack played the perfect support role in that line of anchoring them and just when you get them off if you get them if you get them off for a shift and think great on comes national league experience you know in, in barnes garner and their import you know their importer and so you just got an ollie baldock and you go oh, crikey and then you've got multi the young kid coming on their third unit it just was a wave after wave and what would i have done differently i think we made individual errors I don't think mm -hmm. one of their goals I looked at and went, you have undone us here. Yeah. And those individual errors were primarily on our top unit, myself, club captain Alex, and, you know, our most important players, where we didn't get it right against the Bartlett's from shift one. And conceding in the first shift like we did the year before, I think just that sense of anxiety and negativity around conceding early we weren't able to recover from it. And even though it, even though we pulled back 2-1 on the power play goal, they did to us what we did to Streatham the day before. Mm. So Streatham pulled it back to 2-1 and we scored within the next shift, which gave all mm. of us the reassurance that we are going to do this. Yeah. And I think the chance that it was the same. We conceded straight after our first goal, you know, to make it 2-1. Had we weathered that storm and got it into the third at 2-1, who knows? And then I make a cast catastrophic error in the third. We win the face off. I miss a pass. Then I fall over and the Barlets walk in on a three on one within 15 seconds of the third. We're four one down and that is it. Game done. Yeah. And credit to them. So fourth place finish in the league. Runners up in the playoffs. Not a terrible season. And I'm not going to ask you for kind of bits and pieces too much re regarding the squad because, of course, 11th of May at the Holiday Inn in Portsmouth is the is the club presentation evening. So uh, tickets are twenty five pound a person. If folks want to get on, get involved in that and go go to that one, uh, double supporters at outlook.com if you want to book your place on that one. But I will ask you about the league in general. So I'll ask you a couple. I'll ask you a couple of questions. The biggest surprise this season in South One. Slam. Although they weren't a surprise, they have a great youthful team. I just think. They were exceptional this year, blew us apart in many a games and others. And yeah, they were they were the team that I think surprised everyone. Average age of 19.8 years at the beginning of the season. They are disgustingly young and I feel very, very old. Think about the league this year that made you scratch your head the most. Sounds really strange, but um, 
and nothing linked to us. But I thought it was really strange that there was, that, I'm going back to them, that Slough had loads of Challenge Cup games at the end of the year, but they had already jumped, Shretham already won the, the Challenge Cup. So they basically had games that meant absolutely nothing. And mm. I just thought that, you know, that doesn't, that needs to change. That didn't make sense. That was what I was scratching my head at. Plenty of players, of course, if we could say, and I'm not going to ask you for player of the year because we can all wax lyrical about that. Who's the one player in this division that isn't getting the due that they deserve? Um, There's probably a few on my team, if I'm being honest, because we don't get the exposure that other teams get. But I won't mention someone from my team because that would be unfair. Um, I mean, he probably is getting the attention that he deserves. So I don't know if it's right in saying it, but the little, the little, uh, the, the younger more said, mm. I, I think he's probably the best player in the league. And the kid's 18 years old or whatever. And Christian is a great player. And so is kind of overshadows him slightly in, over the years. But this year, I think, I think he's been exceptional. I think, I mean, for Stano Laschek to do what he does at his age is unbelievable. Um, like a Drew for us. Um, crikey, you've put me on the spot. Ziggy Beasley, I think, is a a player that, that is getting the credit he deserves this year. But in years go by, he would have just been overshadowed by Antonov. Yep. And he is an exceptional talent. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I think Brindley, the Brindley Caps and Tomlin from Romford again. I, I don't think we talk. We always talk about this, by the way. There's never been a time we felt as the aging player, where a generation has come in and then superseded us. Sounds quite arrogant, mm -hmm. but the, the the players between the age of 29, 35. Yeah, we've never really had a generation that have come into this league, primarily because the 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 GB 20s, the GB 18s all go to national. Yeah. And all of a sudden you've got an influx of them that are staying in national South one. And they are rivaling, if not, if not conquering the old guard as it were. And that's good for hockey. I think, you know, I think it's beneficial that these younger players are coming in and, and are stealing the headlines and I'm all for it to an extent. Just, just don't, don't crumble us too much too quickly. We've still got a few more years left in us, but yeah, it is really exciting to see. And I'm I'm excited for it to see it again next year. How the those young players develop, as well as our young players. Yeah, we uh we do as we said we do tip our, our hat very briefly, of course, towards towards you just mentioned him very briefly there, Drew Campbell. Uh, Joe Scott's pointing out last week on the What's Current stream the highest scoring import in the history of Division Two, the second highest uh, ever scoring import in the history of Division One. Just a ridiculous career that has uh, that has now come to an end. So we thank Drew for not only his uh his time at Silent for everything he's given to Pretty Cocky into the bargain as well. So then, Alex, one last question. One last question before we call time on this and we can kind of close the book on uh, on the Solent Devil season and we can go and see how Stretton do against Billingham. I've been commentary in a couple of weeks' time. Give us a bit of news. What can we give the fans at the back end of this to tell them something great for next season? What can we give them? Um, I think the news, albeit in, in the infancy, is we we are we are looking at potentially replacing someone like drew not with someone of his age though <laughs> so that's all i'm going to give you we're, we're hoping to replace someone like drew just not his age and for that it takes a lot of groundwork and we're starting that now wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't try to get something out of you at the end of it. Either way, it might make sense to no one, but it makes sense. No, to no, no, to you then, no, no, no. Enough people will probably have some suspicions about the kind of player that you're going to get. Although if they can score from sitting on the floor, uh, all the better for that one. Either way, Alex, uh, the season did not end in the in the way that any that folk in, uh, folk in gospel would have liked. But congratulations on the campaign itself. Uh, enjoy presentation evening when it comes along. 2024-25 starts now. It certainly does. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.